Hello, everyone, and welcome to Northrop's second virtual happy hour with Galeem. My name is Kristen Brogdon. I am Northrop's Director of Programming, and I am delighted to welcome you here. I'm speaking to you this evening from my home, which is on Dakota land just outside the Twin Cities in what is now known as Minnesota. And for accessibility purposes, I will tell you that I am a white woman with blonde hair and a ponytail. I'm wearing glasses, my uh, Ruth Bader Ginsburg descent collar earrings and a necklace. I have on a gray jacket and I am in front of a beautiful painting by my friend Amanda Moody. We are excited this fall at Northrop to be hosting a Galeem virtual residency and it starts with these happy hours and will culminate in an online performance on November 19th of Galeem's uh, new dance film based on their work boat. I'm going to introduce a couple of Zoom features for those of you who are not quite as familiar with the platform. I encourage all of you to use the chat feature, which will be in the bottom center of your computer screen or near the top right if you're on a mobile device, and use that to introduce yourselves, talk to each other during the presentation, and, and have a conversation about the conversation that you're hearing. There's also a specific Q&A feature that's right next to the chat, whether that's at the bottom of your screen or the top right of your mobile device. And the Q&A feature can be used to ask questions for Andrea and Kyle. And I'll be back with about 10 minutes left in the event to, to moderate some Q&A. Our next virtual happy hour is with Michelle Dorrance on Wednesday, October 21st. And I encourage you to visit northrop.umn.edu so that you can join us for that event. And there you can also buy your tickets to Galeem's online performance on November 19th. Uh, they're making something entirely new with their dance film boat, and they're also including Twin Cities musicians in the sound score. So please feel welcome to join us that night. Now, without further ado, I will introduce Andrea Miller, a groundbreaking artist who brings unbounded imagination, physical virtuosity, and a sense of deep humanity to her work. Her creations penetrate the elusive meanings of existence with unbridled nerve and a rare poetic instinct. Miller's acclaimed works and commissions have been performed worldwide by Galeem, as well as other leading dance companies in theaters, museums, gallery spaces, films, fashion shows, and branded marketing events. Recent live dance commissions include many companies our Northrop audiences will recognize, including New York City Ballet, Abraham in Motion, now known as AIM, works in process at the Guggenheim, Ballet Hispanico, Martha Graham Dance Company, Ailey 2, Rombert 2, Netherlands Dance Theater 2, and many others. She also works in fashion, film, and has experience in many university settings before this one. Please join me in a warm Northrop welcome for Andrea Miller. Andrea, thanks so much for joining us today. I think that Andrea might be having some technical difficulties. So I will get started by also introducing Kyle. And I have to admit that I don't have Kyle's bio in front of me, but I would like to just acknowledge that, um, that Kyle's company, Abraham in Motion AIM, was the last company that performed on Northrop stage before we closed down for the pandemic. So we are absolutely delighted to have Andrea here with us and also for for this current conversation. And Andrea, I see, I see that you are here. So I have just introduced you and I'm so happy that you are here with us. Welcome Andrea and we'll continue with your part of the program. Thanks so much. Thank you, Kristen. Thank you for the introduction. My, my internet while you were doing the introduction sort of disappeared. So I, I hope I might've missed some of what was said. So forgive me if my introduction repeat some of the wonderful things uh, that Kristen was was sharing with the, with you. Hello, I'm Andrea Miller. I'm uh, the choreographer and artistic director of Galim Dance. And I'm very excited to be here with you today. Um, I'm um, zooming in from Manhattan, which is um, from the Moonsea and Lenape and Wappinger, Wappinger tribes, I'm freaking probably um, destroying that. But um, I am I'm a female with a kind of 70s um, pattern shirt on uh, in front of a green couch and a painting by my friend. 
Um, and so here we are. This, uh, this is a happy hour. I hope everybody is going to get their drink. I think uh, Kyle will talk us through maybe how he makes his drink and we can all um, sit back and get into happy hour mode because I'm sure it's been a crazy time for all of you. And this is really the moment to just relax and have, have fun together. I, Happy hour was originally designed as a way for me to get drinks with my uh, with people that I admire in the field, and uh, it turned out to be a good way for audiences uh, to do the same and to get each other to get to know each other through this more um, informal and, and intimate way. Um, so please feel free, as Chris and I'm sure said, to add your questions and comments. Um, or emojis um, in the chat box, and we'll respond to everything we can. Um, I, I'm sure Kristen mentioned this, but um, this this is actually what happens when creativity sort of jumps into a really uh, difficult situation. Um, we were supposed to be touring to Northrop in November, and after um, um, it, talking through and dreaming through things with Kristen, we found um, that there was a lot still that we could do together and connect together. So we'll be um, bringing Boat, uh, an adaptation of one of my works for um, film, um, also working with the um, musicians in, in Minneapolis. And we have happy hours and classes with um, master classes with the students. Okay, so now this is the part that I'm very excited about. Um, I have the pleasure to tell you about uh, someone I admire so much and who I've uh, gotten to know more closely. And um, I'm really looking forward to spend the hour with him. It's uh, the wonderful, most inspiring Kyle Abraham. He is a dancer, choreographer, artistic director of AIM. Uh, he's nothing short of like incredibly accomplished um, he's been named Dance Magazine's 25 to Watch. Uh, he won Princess Grace Award for Outstanding Choreography, as well as their Statute Award, a Bessie for Outstanding Performance. He was 2013 um, MacArthur Fellow, uh, named Resident Choreographer of New York Live Arts, Jacobs Pillow Dance Award recipient. He is a USA Ford, uh, Ford Fellow. He has been commissioned by, uh, to choreograph for companies all over uh, the world, including New York City Ballet, Hubbard Street, Alvin Ailey, Paul Taylor, American Ballet Theater, um, and most recently, uh, his work Pavement was listed as among Dance Magazine's top 20 dances of the past 20 years. Um, oh, and not let's not forget that he was he was a choreographic contributor for Beyonce's 2013 Vogue cover shoot. There's so much to find out about Kyle, and um, I um, I look forward to to spending this time with him. So Kyle, come and join us, and let's get into it. Hello, hi. Hey. <laughs> hi. It's nice that you couldn't see me blood was off. I'm like, oh my god! <laughs> Too many kind words. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, next time I, I'm gonna, I would like to see see you go through it because there's just. <laughs> I mean, you should you should really um, take. I don't know if you ever have time because you're working so hard to like to let in and all of that. Uh, just awareness of all that you've done. Do you, do you get to rest and like look back and say like, oh my gosh, this is awesome. We've done all these things. Are you just so Maybe it's like, you know, I think people in Twin Cities would definitely relate as someone com coming from like Pittsburgh, very blue collar world, you know, it's like you really, instead of looking back and patting yourself on the back, you really are constantly looking forward and thinking about what else you can do to better, you know, the situation for for people around you there's so much work that we still got to do so it's you know it's great to receive accolades for sure but there's just so much work there's so much work to do <laughs> what what would you say i mean i'm just gonna jump right into oh wait were you gonna do your drink 
Can you I do don't it? Know. Oh my God. Because uh, I think maybe some people might have gotten ingredients. So I know that you might not drink it, but that. Yeah, yeah. Let me pull them up because I. So just so you know, I hope you all dig the drink. I have like a digestive problem at the moment. So I am working with water. <laughs> um, but let me see if I can pull them up. You know, I was just trying to do some research and figure out some of the best. Um, uh, mocktails. I don't really drink myself. Um, maybe, yeah, I just don't really, not for any other reason, but I think you need a reason. <laughs> um, but let me see if I can pull it up. I oh. actually, I didn't get my, my drink ready in time, but oh. I noticed that I have like an actual alcohol <laughs> bottle near me, <laughs> which I feel like in a time of COVID is as close as the wine bottle sometimes for me. <laughs> <laughs> so, so people that are following the drink maybe i can try and put the link or someone can help put the link um on this chat just so you can find its source but it's from um wellness with courtney um from her blog um so it's a pear cinnamon mocktail Ooh, um, that's great which it needs one cup of sparkling water um an andrew pear um half a teaspoon of cinnamon a teaspoon, uh, sorry, uh, yeah, <laughs> a teaspoon of lemon juice, um, cinnamon stick, and some rosemary, and some coconut sugar, if you have that, some ice. Um, so you're just going to well, you cut the pear in some slices, and you just kind of like mush it a bit, um, just like a fourth of it, a fourth, yeah, about a fourth of it um, into like a regular size glass and you just fill it with ice and all of the liquids. Um, and then you just kind of, it's really just simple. You just then put all those other ingredients together and just stir it well and just put some of that rosemary around it and some of the pear and the cinnamon stick in it to just make it look cute. But that's really all that there is to it. Um, let me see, maybe the ingredients and everything were Oh yeah, it's it's right there. Huh, I see it there. Good looking out. <laughs> Thanks, Kristen, for doing that. But that's the drink. And water never fails, people. Even if you're drinking alcohol, it's good to take a break from it and make sure you're hydrating with water. <laughs> Very true. Very true. So how like how are you right now? What's how what was your day like today? How's Oh my God. Where, where are we landing with Kyle today? Yeah, it was good. I mean, I, it's a little crazy because I, I started this um, week making a project for um, like a short dance film for a company in Europe, in Antwerp. Um, you can guess what the company is, but I don't know if I'm allowed to say, so I'll just leave it at that. <laughs> um, so I do that early mornings. I kind of warm up at 8 a.m. and work with them from like 9 to 11. And then I'm in AIM land for a bit, but I, because I'm also on faculty at UCLA, I have like meetings uh, there on, on my Wednesdays for a couple hours, which are really important, just trying to change the landscape and really change the game as we look at equity and inclusion. Um, so yeah, I do that and back to AIM world as best I can. Um, how about you? <laughs> <laughs> Uh, oh, me? Okay, so me. Let's see. I I, I had rehearsal with New York City Ballet. because I'm. Hey! Like, I can't yeah. wait to see it! <laughs> yeah, I'm excited. Um, you actually kicked this off with Taylor starting with Will Lincoln Center, this uh, digital, you know, get, getting work out, getting the dancers and creativity sort of happening. Um, you did such a beautiful work with Taylor Stanley. Uh, I think, was it, I don't know if it was for Pride, but I felt like it was in the same time. Um, it was like an all, kind of like, <laughs> in some ways kind of like all inclusive um, way to represent Pride, um, acknowledge Black Lives Matter and Black Trans Lives Matter, even though neither of us are trans. I think it's just important to make sure that's part of the conversation, um, but, overall really just celebrate pride and um, the importance of inclusion and um, making sure that people know that our lives um, hold value and are of importance the same way that everyone else are. 
Absolutely. It was such a beautiful uh, film you made. And I think it inspired um, New York City Ballet to just keep going with this with this idea. And so they're they're building five new films, new virtual films with five different choreographers. And we're kind of doing it like in like a week. <laughs> it's very fast. And uh, so, yeah, I was I was rehearsing um, with them. And I'm also teaching modern class for Marymount. So I had class Great. students. Yeah. And all oh, that that part's on Zoom, but the the New York City Ballet was live. So it was good to actually be in the space with dancers working in the elements of nature of Lincoln Center's Plaza. Yeah, I wanna, yeah. Like I want to ask questions, but I don't know if you're allowed to let out all the news yet. I want to know like who your cast is and all that stuff. But yeah, I think it, they're gonna they're gonna slowly release the details. <laughs> but, like, you know, I would shut up anyway. You could you know text later. <laughs> yeah, but it's I have a great cast. I basically when I asked for my cast, I was like. I just want anybody who's willing to dive into that reflective pool in Lincoln Center, roll down the lawn that's like this wavy lawn and like run through gravel, like a tree grove. So anyone who's like, that sounds fun, that's for me. <laughs> then, so I got a list of like very adventurous dancers. That's sweet. Yeah. So, um, I mean, so much has actually happened for you this week. I saw the amazing video, music video that was just released of Sufjan Stevens, um, Sugar. Um, was that this week? Was I don't even know what day it is. Was that? It came out the 15th. It came out the 15th? Yeah. Okay, well, I saw it this week. <laughs> um, a little behind. Well, you know, you're still on there. But I hope let's maybe put the link in the um, in the okay. chat if we can, because, wow, what an exciting collaboration. Um, and also just the art direction on it was just so, ex uh, so exciting. Can you tell me a little bit about what it was like to make a music video? Sure. Yeah. I mean, Ezra Hurwitz is really just a wonderful collaborator and director. Um, he and I actually, we got on the phone to talk about this project months ago when I was in Los Angeles. Um, just trying to brainstorm and think about the, the song and what um, kind of take we may want to have on it in some way. Um, but then because of the times that we're in, a lot of that process was happening virtually. Um, he and I mostly on the phone, not even doing Zoom or anything like that because at a certain point in the day, we all know one extra Zoom is one too many. <laughs> but we had, yeah, we had really nice long phone calls to just kind of like strategize and whatnot and run ideas by Sufjan. Um, but then trying to kind of cast dancers and think about all of the stipulations that we're kind of dealing with at the moment. It was my first time, A, having to choreograph in this kind of way. Um, my dancers will probably laugh at me because my first time counting uh, dance. <laughs> so I'm like, why count? Whatever. Hear the music. Feel it. <laughs> but, but I was counting steps. <laughs> um, but yeah, overall, it, it, was, it was a good experience. I think it was really difficult and had a fair share of challenges because of all of the COVID um, constraints. Um, I wanted to make sure that I could be present for the shoot. Um, and I was, but there are times where it's like, okay, well, you can't be in the room while we're shooting the scene that has choreography because of um, the COVID oh. constraints. You know, the team was really supportive and, and had a, um, you know, had a monitor for me to, to kind of look at. Yeah, but Ezra, he's, amazing. he's been doing a lot of really great projects that everyone should um, take a look at. Well, he's actually doing the New York City Ballet thing. So oh, I'm, yeah, yeah. It's happening. Nice. I'm getting to know him now as we get the, yeah. That's so great that, I mean, it's, it looks stunning. Did you feel, you know, this is recently, I've been I work, working more in film too. And I, and, and I wonder what, how your experience was, but I feel like when I watch the film, I have a hard time watching the monitor. I keep looking at the dance and the dancers 
And it's taken me so long to be like, that's not the con that's not the content and the frame that people are seeing, seeing it live the way that I, I typically look at the dancers. And so just switching your face over to the monitor and, and seeing how the framing and the movement of the camera is influencing how your choreography is being seen. I don't know, how, how has that been for you? Like, was that like a just natural or a challenge at all or it's funny that you say that because i would never think that about you i feel like you would like 100 percent be like zoned in because the work that i have seen that you've made um for film has been just insanely gorgeous and it it has uh you you're able to kind of like have the sensitivity of your stage work and the kind of like innovation that i always kind of expect uh in your work in in the film adaptations um but yeah i really i don't know i think maybe i'm such a rule follower that i was kind of like always looking at the screen um and knowing that like in this digital age it's only about what people are seeing in that screen okay so you were able to to really focus in on that yeah and and did you guys did you did you feel like there was enough time to to work with the camera <laughs> no <laughs> There's like, there's, there's one shot, like, it was like the last shot of the day. I wasn't even allowed to be there for, because at a certain point with the COVID compliance, they're like, yeah, nope, everybody has to leave. <laughs> Just for <laughs> <laughs> <You're> like, all right, <laughs> okay. <laughs> I, mean, I mean, it was fine. It was like a scene that I didn't really have to do much in, but I just wanted to be as supportive as I could for Ezra throughout the process of, you know, it's like, with so much of it being so movement-based, you know, I just really wanted to make sure that like, if there's any question or anything, I can just be like, oh, let's just do this. Uh, how, how do you feel like this time has changed your, you and your company, like how? Yeah, I mean, it's such, I don't know, that's such a, such a loaded question. <laughs> it really is, it's like, it's too much. Yeah, I mean, it's interesting because I, I am a very much like a realist. Um, but I think having had the month of August off, I've definitely come back with a sense of recharge um, and um, a lot of insight over that time of like what I can take on, what I can't. And yeah, just what do I want to hold and give weight? Um, so I, I don't know, it's just a very challenging time for a host of reasons. And a lot of them go beyond COVID. Um, there's so much uncertainty towards really kind of what we do as um, artists, but in the performing arts realm. Um, it's just, yeah, it's just, there's such, so much uncertainty. Um, you know, I had a work that was set to premiere in June um, in Houston, uh, an Untitled Love, set to the music of D'Angelo. Um, it's a work I've been working on for two years. I was really excited to like get to this place where I see it all come together um, and us get to that really great deep place of problem solving and trying um, new things that we wouldn't have been able to because of the timeline before. Mm -hmm. um, but ironically, so much of that work was looking at intimacy and how to um, how to kind of share and showcase um, examples of, of black love and the way in which we love and honoring my, my aunts and uncles and, and relatives in some way. Um, but it's impossible to explore that intimacy right now. Um, and I, I, I am fearful of um, what that experience may be like for certain audience members when we are able to be in a theater again and um, what their reaction might be to touch. It actually might not be the beautiful thing that you're hoping it would be. It may be drenched in some PTSD that people are experiencing. And I'm in no way trying to make light of um, what PTSD has been for, for anyone and any of their experiences in life. These, these times that we're in are just so precarious. It's like, uh, not to be super long winded, but you know, it's like I have this virtual yeah. backdrop up of like, you know, voting. And, you know, I haven't said this to anyone, but I, I don't know how I'm going to feel on election night. And this has nothing to do with, you know, anyone's thoughts perhaps around like what happened four years ago. But for me, 
it's a bigger thing. Like I actually had a panic attack and it was a thing that was bigger than the results. It was like my mother died that year. I moved to LA and for a relationship that didn't work out. Like all of these things, like the, to like then have that election go in a way that like was so surprising, let's just say. <laughs> um, as someone who loves to follow the rules, that was just, it was too much. So I don't really know how I can build a support system around, my, around me for election day um, and the day after, regardless of the outcome. Because even if it goes the way that I hope and pray that it does, it doesn't mean that I'm not gonna be reminded of how I felt uh, four years ago and how I just, I couldn't get up. <laughs> like I really, I, yeah, I fell down and I, I really could not stand. I felt like I didn't, I thought the floor, I was in the gym, I thought the floor was shaking because someone was dropping weights, but no, I just, I felt like I couldn't get up. <laughs> oh my God. Well, I, I mean, it's true that any way that, it, I mean, obviously there's different levels of, of taking in what it what might be but there's still just a feeling of so much work to do, like so much ahead. Right. And it's, you know, it's still loaded. It's what, what you know, however it may, may slide. One may be loaded, more loaded than the other, but it doesn't, it doesn't feel like a, oh, okay, great. Everything's fine again. So I think thinking yeah. about thinking about that, being sort of anticipating that is interesting. Um, I I do feel I do feel like you've been very responsive, like in the moment to this time. You know, I see. Uh, you know, your company has created um, Aim for Change. Is that how you're saying it, or is it AIM yeah. for Change? No, it's Aim for Change. Yeah, it's a dancer led yeah. initiative. They they were really. You know about it? getting that and really making that happen yeah oh can you tell us a little bit of tell me tell us a little about about it yeah sure um so if if um i want to say listeners like we're on a podcast or something <laughs> like, mm -hmm. listeners. it does seem like we're on a podcast because it's just you and me <laughs> in some ways <laughs> people uh watching um visit our website after this talk, um, they can find a link for Aim for Change there. It's a dancer-led initiative that um, is hoping to shed light and um, exposure to a lot of really important and exciting um, organizations. Some of them are, well, the majority of them are Black-led, but looking at um, authors, um, bookstores, um, clothing stores, restaurants, um, yeah, that we, we can shine the light on and give and give uh, a voice to to um, people that might not have had um, that uh, opportunity in the past. Um, that's part of it. There's an ongoing um, blog that the dancers um, have started that um, will continue to grow over time. Um, and everything that you're seeing uh, on, on that site is continuously being updated, um, if not every week, at least every month. Um, there's a lot of resources for people who, um, you know, need bail or um, need to find support in a whole host of ways, mental health, et cetera, et cetera. A lot of those resources are on the website and the dancers really took the time and energy to put all that forth on their own. So it's, it's really great that um, they feel empowered to do that. Right, and that, they all, that, that the organization is sort of nurtures that kind of relationship and voice for the dancers is so is so special and isn't exactly the norm, you know. Um, and I think I think when you were talking about the you know the worrying about what will be in in a, in your experience and and the kind of heaviness of of the last election, I just feel that of of so many artists that I know, like you've you've done so much to build in processing into your work that is the, uh, the, that autobiographical um, approach, that approach of, of interviewing people and getting their stories and making a community um, in your work 
and um, obviously clearly with your dancers with aim for change and just all that kind of um, all that investment um, I wonder if it, if, it, if it will be and if it can be a kind of support to you now do you feel it as something that you've done in some ways to be uh, like an a, a, not a net but like like an embrace hmm I don't know I don't know um or why what's tell me I don't know how does this come about well I think I'm trying to also figure out how to find new ways to do the things that are the most exciting and important to me about a lot of the work that we were doing um you know back in 2010 11 we, I went on my first, um, what people in, in our field will call site visit, where I go to a different town, city or what have you, and get to meet different community leaders perhaps and strategize around different ways of approaching engagement in their communities. Um, but what I started doing, which you were leading to, like talking about um, kind of interviewing people and collecting stories, I started just kind of being so enamored with the folks that I'd interact with that I started to interview them. And that kind of became a larger part of the work um, that I started making, um, thinking about community. Um, and I, I kind of, I really miss that. I miss meeting new people and hearing their stories and seeing um, just the joy and the light within them when they know that someone is really interested in their history. Um, yeah, I just, I, I really miss that. And I miss, I miss leaving those interviews and then like riding back with the dancers or like the next day being in rehearsal and talking about it. And I'm like, well, this goes. <laughs> yeah, I, I really, I really miss that. That's like really, really exciting for me. What's the experience, like how, maybe walk us, could you walk us through maybe the path between interviewing someone and then what, what an audience member would see on stage that sort of has the history of that research or that, that practice. Yeah, sure. I mean, it's ongoing. So I think like what happens a lot of the times is um, we can start with, well, yeah, I'm gonna have to go in any order, any work. Um, maybe I'll start off with uh, some kind of residency um, where I will, maybe it's a site visit that kind of, me and another dancer will go and just meet with some community leaders, but then also try and see if we can come up with an activity or two to just kind of engage with um, different groupings, um, sometimes just based on who I am and how I identify. Uh, maybe it's with an LGBTQAI organization or with a Black-led student union or organization in, in, the, in the community um, and bring them together to talk about our likenesses and differences in some way but related to whatever the subject matter is of the work. So Dearest Home being one, a show that was about love, longing, and loss, or An Untitled Love that is really primarily about love and community. So part of that process is having those um, conversations and early kind of activities and um, then going in the studio and talking all the more, because clearly I'm a chatty person, I can't tell now. Uh, and uh, uh, then just kind of getting into um, movement and um, figuring out kind of um, the essence of some of the people that we've interacted with, how they make their way into our bodies and our spirits. Um, and that's an ongoing thing. And it's something that like, in some ways feels like um, a, a trick that I, I love that kind of benefits me of like, um, yes, doing a show is great, but meeting people and engaging with them deeply is that much more exciting. So like, yeah, we'll come do the show, but we also get to do this really sweet, um, important thing about community building, where we're setting up, in some cases, organic mentorships between um, LGBTQAI teens and senior citizens in a really organic way, by just bringing them together to have these conversations. Um, so these things, to also get to your point, <laughs> um, it becomes a thing where, this is part of the process in the early stage. It continues on as we continue to build the work, but then ideally we're coming back to these um, different communities to show what we've built. And in that time, uh, the dancers constantly need to be satiated. So we're meeting new people and continuing th this investigation and these conversations. So new information is given to them 
throughout the process so that the live performance can stay just that. It can have a little bit of malleability to it as we continue to tour some of these works for, for years. That's beautiful. So it stays like very living. Yeah. And, and you think it changes as you get new, have new conversations or does your work change um, as it gets performed or as things happen in society that, you know, in this, in the, in, in this climate that maybe highlight some parts more than others at different times? So to the first part of the question, yes, the work does change. Um, based on society and the times, no. Um, you know, Black people have been disenfranchised for a very long time. So the work that I make is in a lot of ways addressing that. Um, the women's movement still has a very long way to go. So if I'm making work that is in some ways trying to also shed light on that, it's not really going to shift based on where we're at right now because it goes back to that previous thing that you brought up about like, you know, like are we patting ourselves on the back? It's like, you know, yes, we can acknowledge where we are at today and we can acknowledge as we should, especially in this, in this call, in this, uh, you know, meeting, you know, the power of, um, Ruth Bader Ginsburg and all that she um, achieved for all of us, um, women, men, and gender um, non-conforming, all of us. Um, but we know, especially given all that's going on, how much more work there is to do. So, you know, as, I, as I'm making work so much of the time, it's work that is in a lot of ways based on what my experience was like growing up. Um, ironically, this D'Angelo work in Untitled Love was uh, the college years for me in some ways. Um, but people may not know that I went to an historically black college for the first year of um, my college schooling. Um, I went to Morgan State in Baltimore, uh, which was also the same year as uh, the Million Man March. So a lot of that finds its way into that work, um, unrelated in some ways to what we're dealing with right now. I think the here and now finds its way into the workshops and the way in which people can talk about where we're at today, where we were, and where we hope to go. Do you feel, um, do you feel now as you're, as you're making work, I'm, are you, well, maybe let me start off. Are, are you in, in the process of, of a new work at this time? Like what is, what is in, in your creative um, window? Yeah. I want to, it's also funny because I'm like, I want to ask you these questions. <laughs> um, yeah, but I'm, I'm making, we're, we're continuing working on Untitled Love, um, especially given the uncertainty of its premiere date. Um, I'm working on a new project um, centered around Mozart's Requiem that's scheduled to premiere in 21, um, reimagined with the amazing Jay Lynn. I love her music. If people aren't familiar, check her out. Uh, for the, the Northrop audience, you, you all may remember Show Pony, um, and it's the same composer that did uh, that solo. Oh, that she's um, reimagining Mozart's Requiem? And it's amazing! <laughs> and will we hear Mozart's Requiem, or will we hear mostly Malin? Uh, you'll, you'll, hear, you'll hear both Jalen and the Mozart. Malin. Yeah, you'll hear both. It's kind of... She just, yeah, she, she did her thing with it, you know. Wow. Yeah, I mean, some of it, yeah, you have to really listen closely, um, but you'll, you'll hear it. That's yeah. Deep. So there's some thing, working on some um, film things as we can and expanding our repertory. Um, well, last time we were in the Twin Cities, uh, we got to do a really um, exciting repertory program. So we're just continuing to build repertory programs and continue evening length dances and for people that aren't familiar with that term, a dance that kind of spans a little over an hour in length or 45 minutes, if I can get away with it, uh, to an hour in, in length. Yeah. Working at Galeem. <laughs> yes, at our studio. Yeah. At Galeem Studio in Brooklyn. Yay, we can't wait. Have you already started in the studio? Yeah, the dancers, um, some of them had a rehearsal there today because of the situation that we're in right now. It's only, you know, one to two dancers in, in a room. Um, but they're, they're starting to kind of get back at it and looking at videos and just trying to have more space to learn material and whatnot. Yeah, and move. Yeah. 
So, well, what I was going to ask you is, is if, um, as you're sort of in a creative space, um, do you notice um, that, you know, I think you might have begun to answer this, you know, having a break in August and being able to kind of think about what's important, what, what are the goals, what are, what's the investment and what's the opportunity um, as art makers, as artists, you mentioned those things as being on your mind during this time. I'm I'm just curious to like pull that out a little bit more and like learn if um, how you know those reflections you know um, have are changing the way you work at all if they are or um, if they're not you know if they're not like those reflections how they're maybe changing what you want out of um, your, your process, your path. Yeah, no, thanks for that. Yeah, I don't know, it's, it's such a challenging one. I think, um, I feel like you and I have talked about this before. It's like, you can, it's, it's so hard. It's so often uh, we think about ourselves as like last, you know, it's like, you know, what do I want? I'm like, I don't know. <laughs> um, what do I want for the company? Maybe that's a different thing. But I think that's that's part of the challenge that like I'm um, trying to get to. Um, but questions have come up for me, and I think to be more to your uh, to your question, I think maybe I'm using part of this Mozart work to um, address some of it. I think I have a kind of a fixation around death because of all that I've experienced um, in my lifetime. Um, but I'm trying to actually take it in a, in, a, in a way that I hadn't before and really trying to look at um, reincarnation and folklore and mythology and think about what that means for the hereafter and let that be part of the story of the Requiem um, for this iteration. Um, and thank you, Bridget, for liking my laugh, <laughs> which is <laughs> to me a bit obnoxious and um, embarrassing when I'm doing it in a yoga class because I laugh in yoga all the time. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, that, I think that's more the thing for me. I think big questions that come up that like I'm even curious for you is like, how important is this idea of legacy, right? Like, because there is innately a sense of ego in it, right? But then there's also this fear around like, what what are we doing ultimately as individuals as artists as people that own some percentage of of privilege and or power we all own some right but like what are we doing what do we want to be doing um but how do, how are we also even in all of the hard work that we do how are we also enjoying life like all of those things are so complicated do you feel enjoyment now? Um, I feel, I think the nerd in me feels enjoyment when I accomplish something that like was on my to-do list that was like weighing me down. I'm like, I owe so many emails. And then you do it and you're like, it actually like there's something about it that like as weird as it sounds, it just feels so good. You know, it's like you have however many projects and it may, be part of the reason why I have this digestive problem right now. <laughs> but the second I get those things done, I feel so good. <laughs> yeah, you're, um, I remember when we did an audition together, we shared an audition. Yeah. And you called me and you were like, all right, well, if I have 30 seconds to show this and then 20, you know, you have two minutes to show that. And then, we, and you had structured the whole audition broken down in like just the second. And I was really take, like, it really uh, affected me to see how, how um, disciplined you are in your, in, in, in your organization of things. And, and I, so I'm kind of feeling that maybe that's also, that's what I'm understanding is the pleasure is also in sort of fulfilling like that organization, that investment in organization, letting it sort of um, bring about its flowers. And, and I, I don't know if that's anything, but I, I, from a personal experience, I remember being really moved by, by how detailed to every every little thing you are, 
um, and, and, and on top of, of, of those details. Well, that's mutual. I feel like I, you know, I learned a lot about your process. I think like there's so much um, just like amazing power in like how you know, like that it's important for you to know what you want with the work that you're making and for that to be the final thing. It's like, yes, there are these other things and other parameters, but ultimately it is your voice. And like to know that and to own that is remarkable. And it's something that like is very challenging for me. So like, yeah, from watching you do that and like see how you, how you work um, is really kind of like, it affects, it affects me in the, in the most exciting way. Cause I'm like, you know, my staff, I'm like, yeah, no, no, no. I still wanna, let's do another take of that. Let's like really, really try and get this somewhere where like maybe we could have imagined it to go, but let's, let's just try because ultimately there, there has to be a time where it's going to be viewed and my name is going to be on this thing. So let's get it right. <laughs> so I see you do that. And I, and I really, really love that and honor, honor how you do that. That's sweet. Hey, this is about you. Okay, yeah, yeah, sorry. <laughs> You're sending <laughs> nice things back to me and I'm just flashing. I wonder, I wonder if you ever feel um, uh, too much weight and, um, or responsibility or do you ever feel that, um, like what are the things that, um, what, what is the things that make you feel uh, that, 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 that it, that's a real, not the challenge of like, oh, I, you know, I have to get this done or, or there's another piece or I, you know, they need me to be creative. What is the, like the most, more existentially the thing that, that, I don't know if it bugs you or that kind of like does put weight on you or feels, I don't know if the burden is the right word. I don't know why, I don't know why I can't find the right word, but the thing that really you're up against as, as an artist, um, yeah. is there something like that in, that you experience? I mean, and yeah, of course. I mean, I think the thing is, is like, it's like the thing I was mentioning before it's, you know, um, you know, the, um, kind of percentage of perception of, of power and privilege that we all have, you know, I, I am a black American man. So there are hardships that come along with that, but there's also privileges that come along with that. And so I, it's a tricky thing to address some of those um, hardships without being really aware of the privileges that I experienced in my life. So, I mean, I think that the, maybe the, Thing that people wouldn't expect me to say is that as performing artists and as like dance-based artists, I think we're we are actually in a lot of ways in the toughest part of these times that we're in with this kind of COVID world. There, there are so many of the um, kind of like announcements and updates that are given for restrictions that don't include dance. They just don't even include it. I know. know. <laughs> We're like using like gymnas gym like gyms as some of the protocol like standards that we were trying to understand how to operate with because there's nothing for dance. Yeah, there's nothing for dance. Nobody cares. <laughs> no, it's crazy. It doesn't exist. <laughs> yeah. I mean, the thing that I've been trying to figure out for the lifetime of me is like, is like, yes, we perform, but I also have issues with that word perform. There is nothing more visual of an art form, really, in a lot of ways, than dance. We are a visual form, you know. It, you know, I also it's like it's great that um, you know Kristen's come back to join us, and I want to acknowledge that one of my favorite artists is coming for the next one of these, Michelle Dorrance. When like, yes, I'm thinking about how much of a visual art form dance is, but when you think about what she does with the form and with sound. It is the most trippy, amazing experience. Um, so yes, dance is a very, very visual form. And I wish that we could be respected in the same way that a lot of the visual art world um, is. Um, but also with that, it's like, we also have, have a place when you think about music because music and dance and theater, all of these things that people revere and have amazing you know, Emmy awards, Grammy Award, 
you know, why can't we be celebrated in the same way? Granted, it's not about the celebration. It's just about the acknowledgement, about the work, and hopefully the recognition so we can continue to do what we love to do. We just need more space to be able to do what we do and to be acknowledged that dance is important. Absolutely. Absolutely. Hi, Kristen. Hi. Yeah, Hi. I came back to ask a couple of our audience questions. And, and there's one that I think relates. And so the reason that I jumped back in when I did is that there's one that I think um, is a nice follow up to that last part of the conversation. And Leslie Guyton is wondering, what do Kyle and Andrea think about the mass unemployment in the arts caused by the pandemic? You might want to speak specifically to, to dance. Um, and what do you think it says about the industry? What changes do you believe should be made in the industry when we come out of this? Yeah, that's a big one. Um, I don't even, I mean, I, I think, Andrea, I think you'll, you'll have a really um, super important answer to this just based on, you know, how you, how you work with your company. You know, we're still sustaining at AIM and, you know, we, um, we're just trying to push through as best we can. Um, but thinking about how important for our company um, performance revenue is, um, streaming revenue will never, well, not never, who knows, it doesn't currently um, balance out. Um, so we're really in a precarious place to think about what happens in 2021. And there's so many unknowns that I wish I, I could address all the more. Um, but I, 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 I've seen a lot of dance companies um, taking longer breaks than anyone would wish or um, you know co-directorships where one director um, is, is moving out of New York um, while the other stays and I, I'm curious you know thinking about a company like Mad Boots really really talented dance makers um, if you haven't seen their work please please look them up I, I don't know what's going to happen with the future of their organization and, and there are several other dance companies that I, I, I worry about and um, I'd love to figure out how we can uplift all of us as we try to sustain what we're doing. Yeah, it's, um, I mean, it's a big sucker punch. It's devastating. A lot of dancers don't have jobs now, don't have any, any, not only that they don't have jobs now, but they, they're looking at a really bleak sort of future of what they could maybe do, you know, and they've invested and committed not, they've invested themselves in this, in this practice in a way that is, it's really, it does take all of you in so many ways, you know, you can maybe do other little jobs, but it takes all of your, your body, your mind, that training to the, the degree that, ever, that, that everyone's training in is, um, you know, you're not really prepared to just go into a new a different job market like this. Um, and so we, it does, I do think it's extra important to try to figure out how to, you know, to take care of that work, that labor, that those, the, this kind of, um, these, uh, these artists who, this is what they know. And not only is it that what they know, but they can actually be really influential in contributing to a rebuild to rebuilding, to healing, to processing. One of the most sort of, I think, quick uh, art forms to respond and be able to communicate is dance um, because of just the, 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 the technology of the body is just, and that's not my term, I, but I'm loving it and I'm forgetting the, the name of who I've heard it from, but the technology of the body is, is, is so infinite. And it's as observing so much complexity and then and, and, and adjusting it to a gesture, to like a, to a touch, to a movement. And we all understand it and we all get it. And so this is, there's just so much they can do. Um, and they're sort of just stuck right now uh, in many ways because the opportunity is so limited. And that's why what Kristen and Northrop is doing is so inspiring because um, we are, we're keeping a lot of work alive and a lot of that communication and, and processing alive. Well, thank you for saying that. For us, the really important thing is to make sure that artists still have opportunities to work 
and then our audience still is still have an opportunity to connect with it and trying to trying to keep people inspired which as you were both talking about before it's it's hard right now um before i ask the next audience question i'm gonna um do a little bit of a follow-up because Andrea, I was thinking about what you were saying about um, about dancers and their you know kind of responsiveness, and I'm also thinking about the way that dance as an art form has been responsive over the course of the last several months. And and when I think about the kinds of things that first started to come out that were you know kind of like Brady Bunch Zoom style videos, and when I think about some of the extraordinary work that that both of you and some other dance makers are doing now with the um, with the medium of film and specifically dance for the camera. And I feel like that's a place where people have really elevated the art form in a really beautiful and interesting way. And I'd love to just hear from both of you about, about your work with that medium of film in the recent months. Yeah, sure. Um, I also wanna say just very quickly to the last question that you had asked, that I think a lot of thinking about freelance answers in particular, a lot of people who are doing part-time work and full-time work, all, all the above, should be looking at organizations like Dancers Resource, Dance NYC, um, Dance USA for a lot of different resources to help um, help us get through these times. Um, yeah, I mean, I I am really grateful for the opportunities that are coming up, but I have to balance them um, with what I already had. Hopefully, uh, staying on the book for for a proscenium stage. Um, but yes, thank you to Lincoln Center and to New York City Ballet for coming together to kind of commission the, the solo that I made for, for Taylor Stanley. Um, it's great if more of those opportunities come up. Uh, it's just such a balance um, to, to kind of figure out how best to um, make a work for the stage and present it in, separately when having an opportunity to make something uh, like a film, perhaps maybe um, uh, similar to what you all are doing for Boat, which is a gorgeous work. Yeah, I, I, I really love this. I love this film sort of uh, like appearing as a way that we can that we can expand dance, um, at, um, the experience of dance. Is, uh, there's an access to dance. I think it makes it much more accessible to people because there's a lot of people who feel uncomfortable, not just COVID, because of COVID, but just like aren't going to go to a theater and they're not going to go to, they're not going to be interested or they're, be, but the film is just, just such a really, um, legible way of of seeing things and experiencing things and i just i really love that element and i, I you know like i want to see what kyle is up to if i can't get to the performance it's so nice that i can see you know his amazing music video with sufyan and um so it, it just just seemed like this this um jumping into like someone's home of creativity that I would, that I, I am one access to. And, um, and I also, I, I also feel that, um, it's, it's potentially going to help people back into the theaters as well, because they're, they can, they can learn about different artists. They can get excited about the media, the, 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 the practice of dance and, you know, hopefully we'll be, a, a bridging, a bridging of things. So we don't, we don't lose people. We actually keep maybe bringing in people. Yeah, I love that idea. Um, we have a very important question for Kyle. Um, and Amy Nelson Sander was asking Kyle, your work at Northrop in February, and I think she's specifically talking about meditation, a silent prayer um, with the performance on Leap Day. It included the audio of the police call for Philando Castile. Um, and it was a visceral experience. Minnesota has experienced more trauma with the George Floyd killing. Will you be including that in any upcoming works? You know, for the very first time in my life, I have uh, put a work online that you can watch in its entirety. Um, and it's that work. I just felt like with where we are in this world, this is the first and maybe the only time knowing my dancers and I, that I would, I, I'm kind of putting that out there. So it is available um, to stream however you like. Um, yes, so quick answer, yes. <laughs> is the link, yeah, maybe we can, I can find the link, but yes, it's, it's 
viewable, um, however you'd like. And thank you for the question. Yeah, it, it was something that um, that we at Northrop um, talked a lot about after the murder of George Floyd and were reflecting on on that meditation of silent prayer and, and shared it out with our audience again as well, just because it's, um, like you said before, Black people have been, you know, sort of going through these um, disenfranchised moments for, you know, 400 years. You know, it, it's it's unfortunate that that it keeps coming back, but to have that as a touch point, I think, was meaningful for us to to be able to um, to grieve in a, in a certain way. So, thank you for for the work, and I'm I'm sorry that you had to make it. Well, thank you for for uh, Laura for ask for. Uh, asking if it's on my website. I was like, why haven't I put it on my website? <laughs> but, there's, there's like images of it on my website, but the dance isn't there. Um, but the link is there, so <laughs> thanks for putting it there. Um, you know, you know, we got a small, we got small operations over at AIM, you know. <laughs> but, but we'll put it up there for sure. <laughs> Well, I want to thank you both for being here tonight. I was having such a fantastic time while I was kind of off screen just listening to both of you talk about your creative lives. And I really appreciate you being willing to share that with all of us and with each other. And it, it's, I think, bringing meaning and, um, and inspiration to a lot of people during a time when, um, when we could just be isolated. So thank you both so much for the conversation tonight. And we look forward to keeping up with, with everything that both of you are doing. I'll put in one more plug for the conversation with Michelle Dorrance on October 21st. Thanks, Kyle, for bringing that up again. Yes, I love her. <laughs> yeah, she's fantastic. She was with us last season, too, and she's absolutely brilliant. So um, we're really happy to, to have her back after having had a chance to, to talk with you again. So, um, so thank you, Kyle. Thank you, Andrea. And, um, and thank you to all of you who joined us this evening. Have a great rest of the night. Yes, thank you, Chris, and thank you, Kyle. Yeah, thank you both. Yes. Bye.